We're going to talk today about face surveillance. The use of face recognition systems for surveillance is becoming more common and um, it's widely used by law enforcement agencies, governments, and private companies. And these programs are often deployed with little regard for privacy or civil liberties. This has prompted several cities such as San Francisco to ban the use, uh, government use of face surveillance. Many other cities across the country are considering their own bans or moratoria. Yet many legislators in various states have introduced bills to regulate the use of face surveillance, often in ways that don't address its many problems. In California, Assemblymember Ed Chow has introduced one such bill, AB 2261, which would promote the expansion of face surveillance in the state. A broad coalition of groups from across the country have joined together to oppose this bill, and we're pleased to have speakers from some of those groups here today to talk about how it and proposals like it affect their communities. We're working to stop this bill as it moves to the California legislature in the coming weeks. And if you'd like to help us, please take action through the organization whose page you're watching on right now. Um, so we have a great panel here providing insights on this problem from a lot of angles. So we're gonna kick it off by letting each of them speak about their work and what brings them uh, to the table today. So I'm gonna start with Jennifer Jones. Jennifer is Technology and Civil, Civil Liberties Fellow at the ACLU of Northern California. Jen, I know you've been tracking not only this bill, but this issue very closely at the ACLU. Can you talk a little bit about how we got here and why this bill is particularly concerning? Sure. Um, thank you, Haley, and hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'll give a brief overview of the history of some of our work in this area and the events leading up to this bill. So as we all know, the use of surveillance to monitor and track people at the federal, state, and local levels really increased dramatically in the wake of 9-11 nearly two decades ago. Um, that tragic event was sort of used by government agencies to justify dragnet surveillance of people nationwide, ostensibly to combat terrorism and prevent another similar event from happening again. Um, but it was done so with little to no regard for the very serious civil rights and civil liberties concerns that were implicated with such measures. So our technology and civil liberties project here at ACLU was founded in the early 2000s in the midst of that tumultuous period to fight back against the entrenchment of infrastructure here in California by all government agencies, um, with a particular focus on law enforcement, whose approach to policing during that time really sort of shifted to a predictive framework that included the monitoring and watching of folks closely in hopes that crime could somehow be prevented. Um, over the last 19 years, we've witnessed the increasing use of surveillance as a form of policing and social control that has been also matched by advances in technology that really aid in facilitating that. So now we have multiple corporations um, seeking to profit from this policing framework by creating and marketing technologies that can do everything from monitoring social media activity um, to drones that can observe entire neighborhoods at once. And then of course we have facial recognition, um, which is the subject of tonight, which is able to identify folks by matching an image of their face with other pictures of them that live in a database. Um, this technology has become increasingly popular over the last 10 years or so, and it's touted by proponents as the future of solving crime. Um, if history tells us anything, however, we know that whenever new forms of surveillance are implemented, they're often done so against our most marginalized and our most vulnerable communities. So that includes black and brown folks, religious minorities, and low-income people. And that's regardless of whether or not anyone has actually committed a crime or is committing a crime. The way surveillance works, some people are presumpti presumptively criminal and targeted for monitoring, even for activities that are protected by the First Amendment. We've seen that with the surveillance of Muslims in mosques nationwide in the years after 9-11, and with the targeting of activists involved in movements to protest climate change or to protest state violence. We also know that ICE has used the technology to search state driver license databases and locate people for deportation. So this history is really what makes us concerned about the widespread use of facial recognition. It's not just about creating hypotheticals about what could happen, although there certainly are some novel scenarios that could emerge from the normalization of this technology. It's really just being conscious also about what historically has happened and knowing that these technologies help to maintain the status quo of who was targeted and monitored and criminalized. But I do also want to emphasize that the more widespread this technology becomes, the more it impacts everyone. It really impacts all of us. 
There was reporting earlier this year in the New York Times about a vendor that has been scraping social media photos and other websites on the internet to add those photos to a database, which really makes it easy for anyone who has access to that software to discover your name and information about you with just one photo. And we really need to think about what that means for the privacy of all Californians, um, what that means for someone exercising their reproductive rights or going to access mental health services. Do we really wanna live in a world where people can easily know exactly who you are at all times? Or do we want to live in a world where we can retain levels of anonymity and privacy um, that most of us to this point have taken for granted and probably never thought we'd have to fight for? So these are really tough questions. They are questions that require us to really think through the impact this technology will have and how it can cause harm. And it requires the political engagement of Californians who according to polling, the vast majority don't want their government to have access to tracking capabilities enabled by face recognition. Um, this will be difficult and it might take a long time, but it's really necessary that we think these issues through. So this is precisely why AB 2261 is such a dangerous bill. It really doesn't address these important questions or really do anything to address the potential abuses of the technology. The very weak regulations it imposes actually legitimize and norm normalize the technology in a way um, that we've seen is pretty unprecedented. I think when folks think about facial recognition, there is a general understanding that it's creepy and it's problematic. And cities like Oakland and San Francisco and Berkeley have passed bans because people don't want to feel like they're living while they're being watched. But AB 2261 sort of ignores that reality and it creates a legal framework that is rather permissive. As far as private companies are concerned, the bill allows them to use face recognition to exclude people and deny essential services such as access to housing, employment, or healthcare, as long as there's someone who signs off on that decision. On the government side, it really doesn't call for any regulations or protections. So government agencies can use facial recognition by simply filling out the right paperwork. In short, this bill really allows companies to use the technology to sort of self-regulate. And that sends a message that they can continue business as usual. So this is what we're really up against right now. Um, and it's why it's important for folks to take action and contact their legislators to let them know that while you support the regulation of facial recognition, um, these weak regulations that have been presented are simply not the way to go about it. Thanks, Jen. Really appreciate that um, background. Uh, Bob, Jen gave us some really good kind of broad background on how our uh, background on how we got here uh, to this point legislatively. Can you talk a little bit about the state of California law relating to face recognition technology and how this bill would change that landscape? Okay, I'd be happy to. I think we're supposed to introduce ourselves, so I'll quickly say uh, I'm a criminal defense lawyer, been doing that for 46 years in California. Uh, I'm a fellow of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, so I have a sciencey uh, background, you might say. Uh, but I'm also past president of the California Attorneys for Criminal Justice, which is the affiliate of NACDL, the National Association. And uh, we, CACJ, uh, oppose this bill. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I've been asked to come and talk about it. Uh, we've got brilliant people here who have uh, really interesting things to say because we have a little preview of some of them. So I'm going to keep this pretty short. Uh, first of all, uh, the present law is twofold. And to a certain extent, that was just covered. But uh, the, the present law right now allows localities and localities have done that to ban facial recognition technology. Uh, and we do not want to have a state law that supplants that good work that's been done uh, unless that state law is equally or even better uh, uh, suited to the task than the local regulations. Uh, the second thing, and I think this is really significant, um, is that we have a law right now, it was passed as AB 1215, uh, that was enacted last year and became effective this year. Uh, and that law specifically talks about law enforcement. Now, if there's any uh, positive to 2261, the, the bill we're talking about now, uh, it would help regulate other uh, entities besides law enforcement, private individuals and other agencies. The problem is that it doesn't do it well, as has just been explained and will be explained in much more detail 
Uh, and so it actually opens the door and creates a situation uh, to make matters much worse. However, one of the things that's not really subtle, uh, but it may be a little bit esoteric to start with, is that AB 1215 uh, first of all, it had two, two uh, significant things. One, uh, it has a ban, it created a ban, this was last year's, it created a ban on uh, biometric data analysis, not just facial recognition technology. So facial recognition technology is just a small part. This proposed bill only deals with facial recognition, not with the other issues like uh, the technology that can uh, develop uh, information based on a person's gait, the way they walk, based on uh, the other body measurements, other body metrics, uh, on skin color, and a lot of other things. Uh, so we have so far in California banned all of that from law enforcement's use in body cams and other uh, cameras. Uh, this bill would undercut that to a certain extent. It would be a later uh, iteration of rules that would apply not only to other businesses and, and entities, but would apply to law enforcement. So uh, I don't think we want to take away from a very concise, precise bill that dealt with an issue. Uh, it was precise, but it was also a little broader in the, in the technology that it covered. Uh, the other thing I think is significant is that uh, 1215, the one that was passed last year, and so this is the law of the land, recognize the legislature said quote that uh, biometric technology uh, data analysis quote uh, pose unique and significant threats to the civil rights and liberties of residents and visitors so there's a legislative finding that this kind of technology poses unique and significant threats okay ab 2261 codifies a section that says that facial recognition technology can present risks. That's a lot different than poses unique and significant threats to civil liberties. It can present risks, but then worse, it goes on to say that on the other hand, it provides the benefit of improving security, provide, this is one I love, providing individuals with efficient identification experiences. As if you get up in the morning, and hope to have an efficient identification experience during the course of the day. Uh, it also talks about locating missing and incapacitated individuals, identifying missing persons, and keeping the public safe. So it only talks about security and safety twice in there. Uh, so you can balance that against the risk uh, as opposed to the all-out ban that uh, was imposed by the law presently, is imposed, uh, that recognizes that there are unique and significant threats to civil liberties, and as a result, don't do it. So this allows it to be done, uh, and then provides some pretty, uh, pretty much a patchwork of ineffective uh, ways to regulate it. And others will talk about this. Uh, I don't want to run over my time here. So real quickly, uh, one of the things that you look at in this bill is that it conflates both regulation of private in, uh, entities with uh, criminal law uses, which is makes a mess out of the whole thing. Uh, it doesn't recognize for forensic purposes uh, what we look at at AAFS uh, and under the PCAS report and other uh, standards as uh, standards of validity. Uh, and it doesn't meet the standards of validity. There are false positives. Uh, false positives unfortunately occur primarily with regard or, or un, unrepresentatively uh, with regard to people of color uh, due to technology issues, but also due to the fact that these things are run by humans and humans tend to screw it up. Uh, and they're one of their big, uh, in this bill, one of the big suggestions to make sure things work right is they have a human review. And we all know that, uh, well, all these things are admirable on one level or another, but we're talking about serious things like identifying people and making their lives miserable uh, human review uh, has not shown to uh, pass muster in, in our current society, which basically historically, as I've just referred to, is based on white supremacy, uh, capitalism, and patriarchy. So uh, we at CACJ oppose it. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate that. 
Um, so I'm next I'm going to turn to Caitlin Jackson, supervising attorney in the capital defense practice at Bronx Defenders. Caitlin, your organization is really, you know, we've heard of sort of about the legislative and the legal background, but your organization is really on the ground working to provide legal resources and services to many people directly affected by these technologies. We often hear law enforcement say this is a necessary tool for them. If face recognition can help law enforcement solve crimes, why should we deny them that tool? I think that's a great question. Um, I am supervising attorney, not in the capital defense practice, um, but uh, just in the criminal defense practice. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, no problem. No problem. Um, I think that's actually a really good question and a really fair one. And there's two reasons that I think this technology is really dangerous in the hands of law enforcement. Um, one is that there are really serious accuracy problems with it. We have historically, as a nation, done a really horrific job of keeping bad science out of criminal courts. Um, according to the National Registry of Exonerations, 23% of all wrongful convictions were caused either in whole or in part because of false or misleading forensics. That is a ton of innocent people whose lives have been upended or destroyed because collectively we have done such a poor job of keeping bad science out of criminal courts. And facial recognition has all of the hallmarks of very bad science. Um, so that's one reason. But the other reason that I think it's really important that we keep this out of this tool out of the hands of law enforcement are privacy concerns. Uh, it's a bedrock principle of the criminal justice system that there's some things we don't allow police to do, even if it meant that they would be able to solve more crimes. Right, that's why we have a Fourth Amendment. It is baked right into the Constitution. Police are not allowed to engage in unreasonable searches and seizures. So what that means is there are all kinds of things that we don't let police do. They would solve more crimes, for example, if they were allowed to show up at any of our houses and demand to search our house anytime they please. They would solve more crimes if they could do that. If they were allowed to listen to all of our phone calls all of the time, police would certainly be able to solve more crimes or if they could put GPS trackers on our cars. But the framers of the Bill of, uh, the Bill of Rights decided more than 200 years ago, that's not a trade we're willing to make. That solving a few more crimes is not worth giving up these really serious privacy concerns. So if we were to allow law enforcement unfettered access to facial recognition technology, we would be walking that back in a serious way, that bedrock principle, and we'd be giving law enforcement a tool that allows them to mass surveil all of us all of the time in ways um, that before they have never been able to do. So I wanna talk a little bit about how that actually is working on the ground. I practice in New York where law enforcement does use facial recognition to identify people. So the way that it's being used currently there's general agreement, I think, among law enforcement agencies, both in New York and Florida and the feds, that this technology has serious enough accuracy problems that you can't actually present it in a courtroom. It is not going to pass at this time, right? It is not going to pass a hearing testing the science. So the way that it's being used is not in a straightforward way, but in a secret backdoor way that is very hard to challenge. So what that looks like is that law enforcement will use facial recognition software and they'll zero in on a suspect. And once they have decided who they believe has committed this crime, they will then look for other evidence to support the conclusion that they've already made. Often that other evidence is very thin and often it is very much um, problematized by confirmation bias. Once they've got that other evidence, when the case comes into criminal court, the fact that the initial suspicion was based on facial recognition will be totally whitewashed. And the case will come to court looking like the person was arrested based on this other evidence. And if the defense attorney doesn't do a serious amount of digging, the person charged and the defense attorney may never have any idea at all that what is really animating this arrest is facial recognition. So for like a concrete example, um, one of the first facial recognition case I picked up came to me and it looked like an eyewitness identification case. So 
when I got it to court, it looked like my client had been arrested just on the basis of an eyewitness picking him out. I didn't find out until I sent an investigator out to talk to this eyewitness that in fact, what had really happened was that law enforcement had shown up to get surveillance video. And when they'd gone to meet with this eyewitness, they told him, in fact, we've got this really fancy facial recognition software. We're going to run these images through that and we'll come back to you. And they did. And when they came back, they didn't do a lineup. They didn't do a photo six pack. They brought a single photo to this eyewitness and said, is this the guy? A photo that they knew that this guy knew came from facial recognition. It is really hard to imagine a more biased way that you could do an identification procedure. But that's what they did. And of course, he said, that's him. In this particular case, my client had an incredibly strong alibi. The day of the crime, he was in the hospital when his child was being born. But what happened was that this eyewitness was, and the prosecutor and the police had this totally false belief in the accuracy of the facial recognition software, and it blinded them from being able to really evaluate you know, the evidence suggesting it got it wrong. And I think that is really the story of how facial recognition is being used right now. There's this general understanding that it's not accurate enough to get it into court. It's not being used in a way, um, in a, a straightforward way, but it is animating arrests all the time that often probably people have no idea about, even the defense attorneys, even the defendants. And because it's being used in a secretive way, it becomes almost impossible to challenge in court. Thank you for that. I mean, I think, you know, that, you know, that those are some really compelling examples of the of the real world harms that we're seeing in the ways that this is being applied. Um, you know, Nash uh, is uh, Associate Director of Community Organizing, my colleague at EFF. Um, you know, given those really compelling examples we just heard from Caitlin about how harms are playing out. Um, you know, if this bill, if this kind of regulation that this bill is proposing isn't what we need to stop face recognition, what is? Nash, I think you're on mute. I sure was, thank you. And, I, and it's, a, it's a really important question and I'm really so, so appreciative of the, of the job that everyone has done um, that's spoken this far on really like laying out like what the threats are and also how poorly this bill addresses those threats. On, it, on its face, it promises to protect California residents from the harms of face surveillance use by private entities and government agencies, but it falls disturbingly short at doing either. And, but, but you're right, of course, doing nothing isn't the answer either. And, but luckily on both the state and local level, we have precedent on what lawmakers and community members can do to protect ourselves and our neighbors from the harms of face surveillance. It's important though that we break this question into two parts though. How do we protect residents from the harms of government use of face surveillance? And how do we stop non-consensual private collection of the information? The actions of companies like Clearview AI have, have made it clear why it's so important that we have meaningful regulation of private use of the technology. And folks have may have read recently how Clearview announced that they would cancel their accounts with all of their customers that were not associated with a government agency. And this was largely in response to lawsuits that were filed against them for violating Illinois' Bi Biometric Information Privacy Act, commonly referred to by the acronym BIPA. And EFF and most of our partners believe that BIPA is the gold standard in protecting residents from unwanted collection of their biometric information, including face recognition by private entities. And remember, we're separating the, the government, the concern of government use of it from the private use of it. And so in addressing the private use of it, BIPA really is the, the way to, to go about it. And we strongly support more states passing laws that like, like, like BIPA clearly and mandate that no private entity collect, capture, purchase, receive through trade, or otherwise obtain a person's biometric information unless they do three really important things. One is inform the person in writing that a biometric identifier or biometric information is being collected or stored. Secondly, that they inform the person in writing of the specific purpose and length of time their biometric identifier or biometric information is being collected, stored, and used. And really perhaps most importantly, and where this bill falls, falls really short, is in, make, in requiring that they receive a written release from the person whose biometric information is collected 
or their legally authorized representative. It's not enough to simply say, you know, outside of this store, we had a sign and the sign said we were going to use face surveillance. And because you came near the store, it was assumed that you were consenting to having your data collected. No. Really importantly, by the BIPA, the Biometric Information Privacy Act in Illinois, mandates that you must have a written release from the person. There must be, you know, active opt-in consent. And so that's really like the gold standard of what should be required for um, for for protections uh, that in regard to the private use of the technology. Now, when it comes to the government use of the technology, as I think that you know, I, I, really Jen, Bob, and uh, Caitlin have all laid out really well. Is, work, is our concern around the threat the technology presents, the Fourth Amendment rights, and the chilling effect that it'll have on people's First Amendment rights is an additional concern. You know, in 2018, Supreme Court Justice, uh, Chief, the Chief Justice actually, Justice John Roberts, stated in his majority opinion for Carpenter v. United States, that, uh, which was a case that dealt with law enforcement tracking a person based on their cell phone activity, that a person doesn't surrender all Fourth Amendment protection by venturing into the public sphere. But government use of face surveillance would do exactly that. And keep in mind, it, even while it would be extremely inconvenient for me to have to leave my mobile device anytime I didn't want to be tracked, at least I can leave my mobile device. I can't leave my face at home. And before anyone asks, no, wearing a mask is not a reasonable or sustainably effective way of preserving that right. People should not have to worry that their political activity, visits to religious institutions, or medical appointments will be complicated by the fear of having these activities made available to law enforcement or nefarious actors that acquire this information through breaches, like the one that happened to CBP uh, last, last year. For folks that don't know, last year, a vendor that was working with CBP was hacked compromising face and license plate information for more than 100,000 individuals. And these people, you know, you can get your driver's license replaced, you can get your social security number replaced. You can't replace your face when it's been compromised because the private entity or government entity didn't have responsible and re reliable protections in place. And so that's another, that's another important thing that, be, that, that needs to be in place and is, and is lacking in, in this bill. And there's no way to, you know, when we talk about the, 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 the First Amendment concerns and the Fourth Amendment concerns, there's no way to meaningly regulate those concerns away, which is why we, since May of last year, San Francisco, Oakland, and Berkeley have enacted bans on government use of the technology. And these bans make it unlawful for government agencies or officials to obtain, retain, or use any face surveillance system or any information obtained from a face surveillance system. And they mandate that any face recognition data that is collected by an agency that's covered by, by these ordinances be considered unlawfully obtained and deleted as soon as it's discovered. They make it clear that anyone who has been harmed can bring a suit against the, the, city, the city or the, the, the agency that's responsible for damages. And they allow for what we call fee shifting. And fee shifting is important because groups like EFF and the ACLU shouldn't be the only ones capable of holding these agencies accountable. With fee shifting, a person doesn't have to be an attorney or, an independent, or independently wealthy because if they prevail in court, the court can award costs and reasonable fees to the prevailing plaintiff. So it really empowers anyone within the community to be able to, you know, as long as you can, you, an attorney is willing to accept that you are likely to prevail in the case, you have, you can, you can, you're more likely to be able to find someone that will help you to to hold to go about this accountability process um, that's provided within within the bill, um, with, with understanding that they will be compensated for their time as should should you should you as the plaintiff prevail, and and there's more good news and 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 Bob kind of spoke to it earlier. We already have a state level moratorium on face recognition and other biometric data collection through police body cams and mobile devices here in California. And in a COVID-less world, I think we would have had a good opportunity to pass more comprehensive moratorium this year. And in fact, lawmakers in New York and Massachusetts are already considering just that. But in the meantime, communities in California can follow the examples that have been set by San Francisco, Oakland, and Berkeley to enact full bans on government agencies using the technologies. So for anyone watching that wants to find out more about how they can pass a face surveillance ban in their community, I'd encourage them to visit um, our About Face campaign website, which is uh, aboutfacenow.org or eff.org slash aboutface. And there there's toolkits and model legislation and a petition to help community groups and coalitions pass local bans in their community. And I also should mention that uh, our friends at the ACLU, uh, so Jen and the folks that Jen works with at the ACLU of North, Northern California, as well as our Electronic Frontier Alliance partner, Oakland Privacy, have developed a really comprehensive guide to helping communities pass surveillance technology ordinances um, that, that really affect all, you know, all, all adoption of, face, of different technologies um, 
that have invasive privacy implications in their communities in addition to like literal like all out bans on face surveillance technology and that's available um, on their site as well as at openprivacy.org. All right, thanks Nash. Um, and last but not least in this first section, I'm going to uh, turn to Mayusha Hayes, Campaign Strategies Director at Media Justice. Mayusha, your work at Media Justice is focused on leading the fight for racial and economic equality in the digital age. Can you talk about why use of this face recognition technology is an important issue for you and particularly how it is discriminatory against communities of color? Sure. Um, hi everyone, thank you for joining. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar with us at Media Justice, we are a national organization based in Oakland, California, and our mission is to advance the communication and digital rights of poor people and people of color. Um, we are also the host of the Media Justice Network, um, a network of 100 plus organizations um, that are working at the front lines of social change. And together we are working towards a future in which we are all represented, connected, and free. As a movement organization, a movement-centered organization, we have to be really clear about identifying what are the extraordinary challenges that our communities are facing today. We are living um, increasingly in a data-driven economy, which means that our personal information, including our faces, our biometric data, our movement, has become incredibly valuable in today's market. For black and brown people, for black and brown communities in particular, our data is being captured, monitored, and tracked um, by high tech surveillance tools like facial recognition under the guise of public safety, um, which is really problematic for us because it's, it's really just a way to um, hide how our data is being used um, and weaponized against us. Um, for us at Media Justice, this technology creates additional uh, barriers between us and our freedom. It exacerbates racism in our communities. And this is why we have to fight against this legislation, any sort of legislation that normalizes the use of this dangerous te technology um, does not belong in our communities. Um, so I know my, my fellow pan panelists have uh, touched on this and elaborated this, but I think it's worth repeating that uh, extensive research has proven that facial recognition um, is a faulty tool. Um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which develops the standards for new technology, concluded that facial recognition was prone to error and was likely to falsely or misidentify women, um, Black people, people of Asian descent. Uh, many systems also misgendered trans and gender nonconforming people. So essentially, for communities who are already systematically oppressed, for Black and Brown people, women, gender nonconforming folks, these communities will face a greater risk of disproportionate wrongful identifications from this sort of technology. Um, this software is frankly a, a threat to our safety. It's a threat um, to the dignity of our communities. Uh, and truthfully to ignore this reality is actually gonna put us, um, it's actually gonna make us even more unsafe. Um, and honestly, even if this technology were to improve, even if this technology was to become more accurate, it would still be dangerous for communities of color because of the legacy of racism, which has always been used to legitimize the policing and surveillance of black bodies. Um, for those who are interested in reading up on this a little bit more, I strongly recommend um, folks to read Simone Brown's book called Dark Matters. If you wanna actually learn more about the history of surveillance, uh, which she argues can be traced back to an earlier system of monitoring and tracking black bodies during slavery. Back in the 18th century, all black and indigenous people were, were required to carry lanterns in public after sunset. Uh, these lantern laws were designed to force black and indigenous people to make themselves visible for the purposes of surveillance. Um, she also points out that the stories um, most of us are familiar with about the cruel practice of branding the bodies of enslaved black people wasn't just about torture, it wasn't just about punishment, which was absolutely uh, needed to enforce this system of chattel slavery. But by virtue of branding your body, your literal body also becomes um, a marker that can be monitored and tracked, right? Um, so biometric, uh, the, the collection of our biometric data really isn't that new. Um, and today's technology continues on that legacy. It forces people to identify 
who they are as the price for moving around in public. Um, this is incredibly invasive. Um, and this sort of real time surveillance of um, our people in public and in private spaces fundamentally shifts and alters our ability to move and exist freely in our own bodies. Suddenly by virtue of your face, this technology could be used to deny communities um, to certain resources like healthcare, housing, um, or even uh, employment opportunities. And again, um, we know that this harm will be heaviest on black and brown immigrant uh, communities, along with you know, workers, unhoused people, um, other folks who um, are not able to avoid public visibility, essentially. So um, you know, this, this, pro this technology is being deployed all around the country, which really concerns us because um, as has been mentioned before, um, when our communities are informed, when they um, know about pending legislation to normalize um, this technology, we vote against it. Um, and so we need to continue to, to keep that energy and make sure that we um, mobilize the right support to, to, to oppose this legislation too. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to shift a little bit, um, you know, uh, we've let people introduce themselves. Um, and so now we're going to kind of dig into some, some deeper questions. Um, you know, Maisha, you've just laid out very well sort of the, the denial of, of, of opportunities and the discrimination um, that this technology perpetuates. Can you actually also talk about sort of the way that it perpetuates surveillance and criminalization of communities of color? Yeah, I think it's really important to emphasize the sort of um, the marketing around facial recognition as a tool um, that is necessary to maintain uh, public safety. Um, this is not a new argument. This is typically the argument that we get um, whenever the government tries to rationalize their investment in the policing and caging of our people. Um, but given the, uh, so given this history of policing surveillance, I naturally always have to question whose safety are we actually really talking about here? Um, we're not talking about us, right? Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit, um, to further elaborate this, elaborate on this point. Before coming to, to media justice, I was the, the lead organizer on the Close Rikers campaign. And when I had joined the campaign, uh, it was very early and its stages had just launched um, and people thought we were ridiculous. Like it was a stretch to demand that we close this notoriously um, violent uh, jail in our city. Um, one of the things that people would often ask, where do you put those people? What do you do about public safety? What do you do about crime? Well, I'd often share this story with people that when I was out on the street, uh, you know, just talking to everyday, everyday people doing outreach, um, when I asked people about the campaign and what they thought about it, people who were impacted and overly, overly surveilled and criminalized by the police were saying, don't close Rikers, that's where I sleep during the winter. You know, um, when we did some voter uh, uh, registration and education on Rikers, a guard who didn't know what we were about, <laughs> um, you know, kind of shared with us if if all of these programs that are offered inside this jail was offered out in the community, most of these people wouldn't have to be here. So it, my point in sharing all of this is that I want people to know that as much as we talk about black and brown people being targeted by the police, um, being over criminalized and surveilled, it is equally important to talk about how we are often the survivors of interpersonal harm, that we're often the survivors of crime. And so if we're actually really concerned about public safety, we actually need to center community-driven demands about what keeps us safe, um, which is to stop criminalizing poverty, which is to stop criminalizing unhoused people, which is about making sure that everyone has access to affordable and decent housing, which is about making sure that we have access to quality education. Um, these are the things that make our community safe. Um, and by talking about facial recognition, by talking about high-tech policing tools, we are distracting ourselves, right, from really what people in our communities are advocating and talking about. Um, so I think it's just really, really important. Like with the, with the introduction of this facial recognition, I know we're talking obviously about California, um, 
But in New York, like I don't have to imagine how much worse enforcement is going to get um, for quality of life crimes, right? I mean, if you've been following stuff on social media, you saw before COVID-19 how the police um, went on war on young black people from for jumping the turnstile, right? I mean, we don't have to guess how this technology is gonna be used in our communities. Um, and furthermore, to that point, uh, it distracts us from actually what are the things that keep us safe. Um, and that's a really important part that we always need to, to include in these conversations. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, you've laid out, <laughs> there's just so many more problems than, you know, than we, than we can uh, solve with just one technology. And, um, you know, you raised a lot of really good points about high tech policing. And um, I think, Bob, you know, I, I do want to ask you, FR is not the only um, you know, not the only uh, technology that we we've seen used. Um, you know, are there other related technologies that we should that should be of concern to the public? Like, why? You know, is there something beyond face recognition that we should look at? Yeah, I referred to that uh, a little bit, uh, and the existing law in California uh, does deal with biometric data analysis in general, and biometric data analysis includes. Uh, a whole variety of things, including uh, determining, quote, identity from uh, gait, the way somebody walks, from uh, the overall body metrics, uh, from skin color, from uh, other issues, including body temperature. Uh, so they take, a, uh, in, a, in a big data sense, you can take a lot of these uh, data points and put them together and uh, use them perhaps uh, to uh, make some sort of uh, either accurate or inaccurate identification. Uh, you know, if we look back at the history of uh, science and the law, uh, which uh, Caitlin referred to earlier, you know, bad science has been a real problem forever. Uh, but remember, uh, there was a time, and I actually looked this up to see if I could find a case. There is a case. There is a time when phrenology, phrenology was actually accepted as a proper science for testimony in court. Uh, and phrenology, of course, was not only not a science, it was nonsense, but it was also very racist. Uh, and I absolutely agree with Maisha and everybody else who said this and then Jen, uh, that uh, this has a disproportionate impact on people of color and, and marginalized communities. Uh, and that is the way the, the law enforcement, uh, unfortunately, plays out. It's not that people are necessarily setting out to do that. Uh, some are, as we all know, and they're bad apples. But in general, it doesn't work that well. And that's why we have mass incarceration that's disproportionate based on race and social status. Uh, that's why the death penalty is administered in a very racist fashion. Uh, you know, it just, it just doesn't work. So when we look at this technology overall, I think one way to look at it really, not just facial recognition technology, but the whole big data mining of biometric data. In other words, they, they can get an image of you, uh, sometimes a thermal image while they're at it, uh, as you walk through the mall, uh, and they can do stuff with it. And some of the stuff is criminal and it works out very badly for portions of the community more so than others. Uh, some of it's civil and you could be denied credit. You could be, there are all sorts of things that happen. Uh, you could be targeted for certain kinds of uh, commercial activities based on these uh, uh, images. And that's why uh, a lot of these were being sold commercially uh, because it was of interest there. I, I just step back and look at all of that, which I think is enough to just say, let's not do it, okay? But then let's let's say I don't care who you are. Do you really want to walk down the street at any given hour? Walk your dog at seven o'clock in the morning uh, and before you get dressed to go to work. If you go, you now we go to work from one room to another. But before you, before you're ready to rock and roll, do you really want to have that image uh, sold and passed around and digested and analyzed? Uh, I think this is a very serious civil liberties issue. Uh, I'm representing a criminal defense 
uh, organization that looks out for the liberty of individuals in criminal cases uh, in this conversation, but uh, just in general. I mean, this, is, as the ACLU has pointed out in their, their brief on this issue, uh, just in general, this is ridiculous. We really don't want this. And the public, to the extent that you're not convinced already, anybody watching this, uh, who wants to say, well, but, you know, maybe it's not that bad. Uh, maybe it's not that racist. Maybe it doesn't really convict that many people indirectly. No, it's all of us. Everybody is walking down the street or going into the mall or doing whatever they're doing and getting their bodies analyzed. Uh, and that's that I think is wrong. Um, thank you. And, you know, I think you really outlined very well the, you know, the thought that, you know, this, this kind of collection is often indiscriminate, um, you know, that, that we don't have control over it. Um, Caitlin, I would like to ask you, you know, if we only let the government use biometric data that people had willingly provided, um, would that solve any of these problems? I think Caitlin may have just lost her connection. Oh, all right. Well, we hope that she will be able to join us again and uh, and answer that question. Um, so, uh, but you know, I, I do wonder then, um, you know, what are some alternatives to this bill? Um, Jen, can you talk a little bit about some of the other solutions that are out there, both, um, you know, uh, that you've worked on and, you know, um, anyway, just talk about some of the alternatives out there. Sure, sure. Um, so the structure and basic approach of this bill um, undermines privacy. The world that EB2261 envisions is one where your face can be scanned and identified at a store or by police, all without your consent or a judicial oversight. And this is a world without anonymity, as I mentioned, and the ability to go about our private lives. And it will lead to databases that agencies like ICE are eager to exploit. So as far as the bill is concerned, I think a moratorium would be a good starting point. Um, real reforms require that we listen to community members. Um, and what they want, as have been demonstrated by bans that have been passed, are strict limits. Um, across the United States, we've seen other, other jurisdictions pass bans as well. We believe that the legislature should adopt a moratorium on the law enforcement use of facial recognition and other biometrics. And they should do so because the threats are known and they're imminent. Um, a moratorium would give us breathing room to at least wrestle with these difficult questions of if and how and when it should be used um, while keeping California communities safe and protecting people's privacy in the interim. Thanks. Um, all right. Uh, I think uh, we are starting to get some questions in from the chat. So I do want to ask, um, there's actually a, quite a couple of questions about, um, you know, sort of public-private partnerships, we've talked about government use, we've talked about private use. Um, do panelists worry that these bans, uh, or I'm sorry, that they're, um, well, can someone just talk a little bit about some of those public-private partnerships and sort of the concerns that those raise um, and, you know, if, if, um, if there are solutions to that? Well, I guess I can I can quickly speak about the, uh, you know, the issue that we saw with, with, with Clearview AI, which, which, it's certainly concerning, and there's there's ongoing litigation. I know it's, it's at least in New York and Illinois around the Clearview's, Clearview's violations of um, Biometric Information Privacy Act in, in Illinois and, and other protections around private collection. Um, another an, another concerning, really concerning issue around like kind of like when you when you cross that line of the public and the private use is and 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 Caitlin's probably more familiar with this with, with than than I am. But you know, in in New York, they there is a a unit that is responsible for using their problematic face surveillance system, right? And they do have they do have you know guidelines around how, how it should be how it, how it should be used. Even though I think that we would question you know how 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 effect how effective and sufficient they are, but they have them, right? But when we we saw recently, most of that was divulged through some some really great reporting and also some some you know some also less. Uh, reputable acts that clear that not only that when the NYPD had turned down Clearview as a service, there were still several officers um, not part of the of the unit that is that is, you know, responsible for the NYPD's use of, of face surveillance technology that were given that were given accounts accounts from Clearview AI and were using the technology 
even though the department itself had already this had already made it clear that it did not meet their their requirements. So we see that like you know in 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 not having effective regulation, both of both and importantly, you know, different addressing the 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 different circumstances differently, but not having effective regulation of both the private use of the technology and the government use of the technology uh, resulted in in the space where you know even if we even know if, if you are if you do even if you do believe that the way the NYPD is going about this is going about and the guidelines that they've set forward and then what and what they've shared around their use policy and I think there's really important legislation in New York City right now the post act that would add more transparency around what those use policies are um, so that so that we could really know you know what are the technologies that they have there and, and how are they being used but in if it like but let's you know give them give them a, a modicum of trust for the, for the moment and say that they must have some use policies and then and, and, and let's and because of the the holes that are left in not addressing responsibly government or private use of the technology, you have those use policies are then made moot because you have a number of officers within the department that are going that are not part of the unit or, and are not operating within those guidelines and working directly with this with this private entity Clearview AI that has you know across the country been engaged in, in problematic activity. And I actually want to add one one piece to that too because I think a lot of folks right now are really thinking about. Um, you know what? What the um, whether different types of technology, including face surveillance, is going to is going to answer the the, the contact tracing questions that we have around uh, you know addressing the COVID crisis, and also and our and 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 there are a number, including 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 Curve AI specifically, companies that are trying you know disaster capitalists, if you will, that are trying to profit off of you know the current concern, and despite what what. Those folks like Curve AI would leave us to believe face surveillance is not the solution to that crisis either. And the extraordinary measures in favor of the public good are certainly needed to fight that crisis. But invasive surveillance technology may actually do the opposite. In some areas of the country, local governments are already sharing the names and addresses of people who have tested positive for COVID-19 with police and other first responders. And their stated intent is to keep those, those officers and EMTs and firefighters safe should they find themselves headed to a call at the, at the residence of someone who has tested positive for the virus. However, this information fails to protect first responders from unidentified asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic cases. And a face surveillance based tracking system would potentially lull police and paramedics or firefighters into a false sense of security when first responders should be treating every call as if someone might be infected. And it may also contribute to stigmatization of infected people, reduce the quality of policing in vulnerable communities, incentivize police to avoid calls for help because of fear of contracting the virus, and discourage people from getting tested. People might not be willing to get tested if they know their information will end up in the hands of government agencies or others uh, be beyond those that are responsible for managing public health. And moreover, the virus is disproportionately harming people of color. Those same communities that, you know, we've, 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 we've mentioned al already are being disproportionately harmed by historic, by, by problematic policing in the past, as well as um, that's being ac exacerbated by the failures of the technology. But again, even if the technology worked perfectly, we would still have those lingering issues, those lingering problems. And when the virus is disproportionately harming those same communities and communities that are already criminalized and underserved and more likely to be misidentified, at a moment when people need the government to assist them in testing, containment, and treatment, the government in turn needs the, needs the cooperation of those people. And using this information to further expand government surveillance systems would erode, would erode that crucial relationship. I'll just add something to that, although it's very hard to add to that. Quite, quite, a, <laughs> quite a fine treatise on the problem. Uh, just from, a, just from a, a, a standpoint of the question about uh, the inner relationship between private industry and uh, government. I mean, we obviously, Eisenhower talked about the military industrial complex and it's, there are various, uh, various uh, themes uh, arising out of that that apply in everyday life these days. But, you know, for one thing, you know, I don't want necessarily, I don't, and I'm saying I personally, but I don't think any of us want uh, this commercial information around where we get identified and, you know, all of a sudden you start getting, uh, I'm only going to offend one other person here. You, you start getting, uh, uh, solicitations on your Facebook or your, whatever you're looking at for, uh, curing baldness. Uh, so it's only, only offended one person in that besides myself. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, right, because this is the sort of thing, if you can do this biometric analysis 
and use it commercially, that's where it goes. The other thing, and uh, Caitlin touched on this briefly, uh, is there's what's called parallel construction in the criminal law biz. Uh, and it, it's illegal. It's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. But parallel construction uh, is actually acknowledged by law enforcement has been trained. We have the PowerPoints they used uh, to train this, that you don't give up the illegal source of information. Uh, so officers are trained and it's, it's illegal. And so a lot of agencies, or hopefully all agencies would say on one level that you don't do this, but there's actually training. You don't, you say here, there's a parallel construction. As Caitlin indicated, for instance, well, this, this uh, shop owner uh, made a positive ID all on his own. So there you go, goodbye, uh, you know, and deal with the rest of the case. Uh, whereas what really happened is you have big data, some other source that can be a crossover from the commercial side to the law enforcement side, just as well as going the other way. Uh, and law enforcement is using this information and then denying because it's not relevant in guilt and innocence necessarily in a trial, at least judges would say, they're denying that, uh, that that's where it came from. So the crossover, I think, is very dangerous just the use by either one individually, either the public entities or the private, is bad. Thanks, Bob. Um, Caitlin is back with us. And, you know, Caitlin, we just heard a lot of ways that, you know, this 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 technology is used irresponsibly. I'm curious to know if you think there's a responsible way, a responsible way to use face recognition in a, in a criminal context. Uh, I think I think the answer is probably no, but I can think of more responsible ways. So certainly there's no responsible universe until the science gets a lot better. But I can imagine a time two or three or five years from now where the accuracy concerns are a little bit less acute. I think it is hard to imagine how we ever fully get around the privacy issues. But if we're, if I'm imagining a world where we have to understand where law enforcement is going to use it in at least some context, the world that I would like to see, what I would like for us to push for, both with facial recognition and forensics more generally, is that rather than giving law enforcement access to this technology, that we really cabinet off so independent scientists and independent labs that are not um, part of the police department, are not staffed by the police department, do not have the same funding sources of the police department, are the ones using this technology. And I think that really starts to solve two different problems. One, if police, if police officers can't use it, it really makes it quite difficult to do real-time face um, facial recognition, which I think creates a lot of the problem about real-time surveillance of people. It's very, it makes it much more difficult. Um, and additionally, if we have some independent body using this, then there are some controls that we can have at least some measure of faith will actually be observed. So like one of the problems that we have now where I practice, we have no idea what the minimum standards are for these photos. So the main way that facial recognition happens on the ground is that there's surveillance video or there's cell phone video and a screen grab is taken from that. And then stuck in this system, they are often so low quality. And we have no idea what are the minimum standards. We don't know. This technology, it can be set, like the way that it works is when there's a photo, it makes what's called a face print. So kind of like a fingerprint, it's a map. And you can set the technology so that it is only going to return other faces that are 95% matches, or you can set it so it returns things that are 80% matches. There are all these different ways that the people using it can manipulate it or use it less responsibly. I don't think there's ever a world where we can trust law enforcement to use it responsibly. I do, however, think it is possible to imagine a world in which we have independent agencies that have access to this, where we are aware of what the error rates are. And, you know, in some contexts that it is allowed to be used with an understanding that it is being used in ways that are scientifically responsible. And then when it comes into court, we have enough information to give juries and judges a real picture of what it's telling us because we know what the error rates are. But before we could get any before we could get to any of that, we would have to fix the accuracy problems. And as Maisha and Nash and a few other people have touched on, it is not universally inaccurate at the same rates. We know it 
operates much worse for black and brown faces and it operates much worse for women. And that is something that would also have to get much, much better before we could even start thinking about how to use it responsibly. Thanks so much. Um, I do want to flag for folks watching that we are running, we're going to run a little bit over. So thank you for bearing with us. Um, you know, but I really want to be sure that we get to these last couple of questions. So Nash, I'm just going to ask, um, you know, we've heard a lot about the problems. What can people do to protect their communities from face surveillance? Yeah, again, it's it's around, I think we've got some really great examples, both on the East Coast and, and on the West Coast here in California, obviously in San Francisco, which was the first and almost, this is almost uh, the one year anniversary of the of the passing of the first face surveillance ban here in California, um, which was later followed by Oakland and Berkeley and and, and a number of number of cities in Massachusetts now as well. And and that and part of that is really like doing, you know, I think Oakland Privacy has kind of set up a, a really good process where they they have a system of monitoring uh, the what's coming up on their city council's agenda, right? And so they so they are able to see what uh, what technology what surveillance technologies are being are being brought before the board. Unfortunately, all too often, a lot of the, the what what they're what they're, what democratic processes and checks and balances there used to be around this acquisition have been. Um, have been circumvented because where they used would, where departments would have to come to the city council to get budget approval and then they would be able to regulate it that way. Now you have you know the Department of Defense do programs like the 1033 program or the our DHS grants that are that are going directly to these agents to, to departments and, and preventing them from being able to, and and circumventing uh, elected officials from being made aware that this that this budgeting was happening. Now, what now the way that you can you can work around work with that is you know go to you know create coalitions that are of groups that are represented and go to go to your lawmakers and and ask them the critical questions right use use the public use public public records act or sunshine laws in order to you know so, um, get requests and find out what equipment is in your community you know uh, I think we've also seen great examples of you know in different cities I think it was Oakland Oakland again being the first one here within having privacy advisory commissions put in place so that there are representatives from different parts of the community that are responsible for being that informed voice in the room. All too often when, when surveillance equipment is being acquired by, by departments, by city agencies, the only expert in the room is the vendor, is the, is the, the salesperson from, from, the, from the company, the vendor, the vendor of the surveillance equipment. So there's no, one, there's no one there to ask the critical questions on the ways that this is gonna impact their communities, right? So having these, you know, so, so in addition to, to passing and advocating for bans and doing the, the, the background work that you need to do with your, with your lawmakers, asking them the important questions and asking and, and encouraging them to get the answers from those agencies around what types of equipment they have or that they're considering of getting um, is, is, you know, Pat, so to, 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 to kind of close it up, face surveillance bans, um, we've, we've seen communities do it. We can, they're, they're, they're bans, they're statewide bans and moratoriums that, that other states are working on that we should be able to mirror and hopefully in, in ne next year uh, in a, in when we don't have as, you know, um, a, a you know trunc truncated legislative session will be able to fight for those kinds of protections here too. But let's not wait until next year. Let's fight this year for those protections within our within each of our communities, uh, and and really st stop it there. In addition to you know in in, in San Francisco, which was the first one. That face surveillance ban was also put in place as part of a larger bill, which created a surveillance, a, a, a community control over police surveillance ordinance that basically made sure that any surveillance, any type of invasive surveillance that a that a city agency, and in, in the case of San Francisco, it's a city county agency, uh, wanted to acquire, had to go through a process where the public was made aware of it, that there was an opportunity for elected officials to decide whether there were use policies and disparate impact that, that were really going to affect and make it clear that there would not be a disparate impact on different segments of the community and that there would not be, um, you know, and that, and that there were use policies that, that provided the, the, the appropriate protections. But again, when it comes down to face surveillance, because of the First Amendment, First, Fourth Amendment, Nineteenth Amendment concerns that we have there, there is no responsible regulation. That is, that, is, that, is a, that is one where we really need to fight within our communities, within our cities, within our towns, within our counties, within our states, for, for a ban, all out bans on government use of the technology and, and BIPA type protections on private use of the technology. And just related to what Nash has said, um, the ACLU and Open Privacy actually just launched a toolkit that actually walks folks step-by-step step through the process of building a coalition 
and either passing a surveillance ordinance that requires community control over what technologies get deployed um, or passing, passing measure, measures like a ban. Um, so you can find that resource on the ACLU of Northern California's website um, and we will drop it in the comments if you're watching live on Facebook as well. And Haley, if I can add one more thing, just that, that uh, Jen just reminded also, in addition to, to, to that is an amazing resource. It's a really great web resource. I highly recommend the, the work that we've done on our About Face site. And also, if folks are curious around what agencies and departments have their face templates, uh, what, what Caitlin was explaining before around like kind of the mathematical representation of your face, you can also, there's whohasyourface.org which is uh, uh, some work, work that our colleagues have done in, in, co in combination with uh, some of the folks that uh, I know, uh, Claire Garvey at Georgetown Center for Privacy and Technology helped out with, with some of the work there too in being able to like put like, you know, do you have a driver's license? Do you have a passport? What state are you in? And getting kind of like a, a real list of like, what are the agencies that right now have access to my to my face templates and, and, and images? Um, the, the FBI's database has, I think, I think it lasts, almost 50% of, of U.S. residents are presumed to, to be in the FBI's um, face surveillance database. So it's a um, good opportunity to get, to get a, a, a real feel for how, how um, what, what are the real, what are the, the agencies that currently have your, your, your information. I just wanted to quickly share too that, um, I can't remember if we mentioned this in the, er in the earlier part of the conversation, but um, you know, the bill is going to be moving um, into a committee um, really soon. Um, so for folks who are watching, um, for folks who, you know, want to make sure that their voices are heard, like, please continue to follow um, any of these organizations. Um, I know Media Justice will be launching an action um, really shortly that'll give everyone an opportunity to um, target members of the, the committee um, and let them know that, you know, Californians don't want to see this um, this bill passed, so. Right, thank you. Um, you know, so we've talked a lot about the ways that people can organize. I do want to just close, Maisha, if you could just talk a little bit about how this technology affects our very ability to organize. Um, I think that'd be a good way to, to close this out. Sure, sure. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, and as other folks have, have said too, like surveillance isn't anything new, and it certainly didn't begin with um, today's uh, version of facial recognition. Um, our government has a long history of spying on us, not just, for, not just to criminalize us, um, but in a way to also undermine our organizing efforts that uh, challenge and threaten the status quo. Um, surveillance is about making sure that the rest of us um, who are tired of racism, who are tired of oppression, don't rebel against the elite white male um, ruling class power structure. Um, we saw this in the black power movement of the 1960s and 70s where our leaders were stalked, harassed, murdered by the police. Um, and we continue to see this uh, harassment today. Um, a couple of years ago, it was exposed that the FBI was surveilling black activists under um, a new term called black identity extremism. And in those leaked documents, they specifically point to um, the rebellions in response to Mike Brown's death as a reason to believe that there was an increased level of um, extremism within the black community because of our perceptions of racism and, and, and police brutality. So I know it feels overstated to be like, uh, you know, there, there's discrimination in our society, there's discrimination in our law enforcement, but we actually have to say that because we know that the response is um, black and brown people are getting riled up because of, of a perceived um, sense of adjustment that is well documented and well known. Um, but I actually wanted to offer a different example of surveillance that I feel like is really pertinent to this moment. Um, it's been mentioned that rushing this legislation in this moment of time um, feels really opportunistic. It's not in line with the sort of um, demands that people are making um, around what their needs are in this moment of COVID-19. Um, and one of the places that I see that um, as really true is in the workplace. Um, work before COVID-19, uh, workplace surveillance was already um, becoming more and more commonplace. For instance, I, I can think of this Atlantic article that published a story about an Amazon worker who was heavily monitored um, on the job and her quota was determined by um, a tech system that monitored and tracked the rate at which she was scanning items. And people are very familiar with 
Amazon's ruthless um, quota uh, uh, policies. So when she failed to meet her quota, she was fired. Um, and my point here is to demonstrate that companies are already using surveillance to monitor, to watch, to surveil their workers um, for the purposes of, of labor production, right? Um, now under COVID-19, with communities across the country heavily relying on, Am on companies like Amazon to provide us with the vital supplies that we need, uh, that demand and that pressure to keep up with that, that pace um, is, is going to be more intense and it's going to be felt the hardest amongst black workers um, who uh, work in a lot of Amazon's warehouses and, and so forth and so on. Um, you know, for companies like Amazon, profit will, be, will come before the safety and dignity of our communities and certainly before their workers. Um, and given the conditions that many essential workers face right now, um, the right to assemble and the right to organize is literally a matter of life and death, right? Um, and so instead of taking responsibility, um, you know, to address the demands that workers have been making around better workplace protections and, and, and policies, uh, Amazon announced on April 2nd that they would uh, rely further on their vast surveillance network to enforce social distancing. Uh, that is not what workers have been asking for. And again, you see this continued pattern of, here's a problem, let's use surveillance, let's be punitive, right? Which is only gonna put people more at risk, right? More at risk of um, being in contact with the, with the police, more at risk of unemployment, more at risk, at risk of all of these different issues. Um, and so again, like I was saying before, like we don't really have to guess how law enforcement will use this technology. We also don't have to guess how this will be used in the workplace. Um, and in this particular moment where people are organizing for, you know, rent strikes, organizing for workplace protections, organizing for, you know, testing and PPEs, like we need to make sure to protect people's ability to organize um, and, 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 and protest. And this technology, in my opinion, undermines that. Um, and the stakes are just way too high. All right. Um, well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. I really want to thank all of our viewers um, for your great questions. Thank you for viewing, uh, for coming to watch us, and uh, thanks for sticking with us. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists. I think, you know, we talked about a lot of the reasons that this is a problem for everyone. Uh, I think we could have another day long conversation about this. Um, and so, but if folks would like to help our efforts to stop face surveillance, particularly AB 2261, please take the action uh, with the organization that brought you here today and please look out for more information in the coming weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.